Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 25. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our hope without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Verse 19 says, The holiest. We discussed the two parts uh, previously in chapter 9, called the first a tabernacle and the second tabernacle, uh, which is simply to say the two parts, the holy place and the most holy place that the Jews had constructed. Um, and that these two were patterns of heaven itself and the place of God's throne. So we have access directly to the throne of God by the blood of Jesus. Verse 20 says, by a new and living way. Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, verse 6. Paul writes, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, 5. Peter says, uh, In whom we have, or, or Paul writes, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And uh, John writes, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, verse 12. Um, but uh, Paul says he sought to pers persecute Christ indirectly by persecuting his followers. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Acts 22, verse 4. Turn also to Acts chapter 24. Keep your finger here. Go back to Acts 24. And verse 14. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. The way of Jesus Christ is considered heresy by anyone who is trusting something else to save their soul and gain entrance into heaven. It's a living way in that uh, the way is a person himself. It's not a, uh, a process. It's not an experiment. It's not a certain religious code of ethics. It's not a religious experience that takes place somewhere, but it's a person. The way is a living person. His name is Jesus Christ. Uh, just like the word branch, Zechariah 6 verse 12, turned out to refer to a, an actual person, Jesus Christ. And the word um, rock, Deuteronomy 32, also referred to a living person, Jesus Christ. And that's confirmed in 1 Corinthians 10 first four or five verses there. Um, through the veil, verse 20, that is to say, his flesh. The inner veil that separated the holy place and the most holy place uh, of the tabernacle, therefore, represents God's clothing. Uh, let's read chapter 1, Hebrews 1, and um, verses 11 and 12 there again. Hebrews 1, verses 11 and, or 10, 11, and 12. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They, God's works, shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So, as crazy as it may sound, 
the universe that we see in the night sky is um, actually shaped like a triangle, or even more precisely like a, a pyramidic shape, with a hole at the very top through which someone can go in and out. The north star, which is probably the most accurate directional point, if you see the Big Dipper arrangement in the night sky, you can't see it here in the city because we have too many lights, but you go up in the mountains and you see the night sky more clearly, the end of the tail in the Big Dipper, that last star in the end of the tail is the north star. If you fix a camera on that north star with a timer to open the shutter once every 20 seconds, every 15 seconds, for example, by the end of the night, the next morning, you'll have a video of all the stars in the night sky orbiting in circle around that point. And there's a corresponding place on the South Pole, um, and you see the stars orbiting the opposite direction. In the South, they orbit clockwise. In the North, from the North Star, they are orbit counterclockwise. Now that means one of two things. Well, actually it means three things. Number one, it, number one, it means the Earth is not flat. The Earth is round. And all of those stars, it, from the South Pole, they would be going in one direction. From the North Pole, they would be seen moving in the opposite direction. Follow? That means either the Earth is spinning, or the Earth is not spinning and everything else is going around us. That's what's called the, the geocentric model. I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm, I tend to lean in that direction, and maybe for a future study, but not today. If, for example, by the way, since we're on that, I touched on that subject, if the Earth was flat, as a lot of these people say now, they say that the, the um, firmament represents some sort of a dome that covers a flat, disc-shaped Earth, like a, like a glass cover over some you know, dish, uh, but there's a, like a, a dome covering the Earth, and that all rocket ships, all spaceships have never gone beyond, the, beyond that dome. When they say they're orbiting um, in space, they've never gone beyond that dome that covers the Earth that everything else is a lie from NASA. And I don't doubt that NASA lies to us. I mean, they're part of the government after all, right? And the government lies. So, <laughs> like a blanket sweep, right? The government lies. But the flat earth proponents say that no one has ever truly been to the South Pole, that what we think is Antarctica is really an ice ring that goes all the way around the outer edge of that disk, and all the countries of the Earth are within that circle, and that the Sun and the Moon are actually much closer to the Earth, the surface of the Earth, and they're kind of doing this dance around each other, right above the Earth. And above that is this dome, which covers the circular Earth, and uh, that's what they consider the firmament mentioned in the book of Genesis. But if the sun and the moon were above each, or were above the earth, doing this sort of this dance around each other. How many have ever seen models represented by the so-called flat earth theorists? Anyone ever seen that model? Some of you. If the sun and the moon were dancing around on top with each other above the surface of the earth, flat earth, then there would never be any such thing as a lunar eclipse. You would never see the shadow of the Earth passing between the Sun and the Moon like we do sometimes when there's a lunar eclipse because they're next to each other doing this thing uh, above a stationary flat Earth. There would be, never be a time when the Earth passes between and the shadow of the Earth passes in front of the Sun or a solar eclipse or in front of the Moon um, and a lunar eclipse, etc. You'd never see that. And concepts such as North, South, East, and West would be irrelevant. There'd be no such thing as north, south, east, and west on a flat surface. How do you determine one or the other? Everything's flat. You can go every, I don't know which direction is, is I'm going in. You might be able to identify the north star, 
but that's as far as you could go. There'd be no such thing as uh, south, east, or west. So that's another thing to take into consideration. But, and I realize a lot of people are going to post comments about that theory because they've been watching too many YouTube videos on the subject matter, but we're not here to talk about that today. Let's continue with our Bible study. But, um, so the way, the way turns out to be a living person, that is Jesus Christ, much as the branch was a living person, and the rock which followed them, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, was Jesus Christ. And that rock is not as, our rock is not as their rock, uh, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 32. Um, through the veil, that is to say his flesh, verse 20, the inner veil represents the, between the two compartments, represent the clothing of God. And look there, or we read Hebrews 1, verses 10 through 12. <clears throat> and I got sidetracked, for, so forgive me for that. But the um, universe itself, as strange as it might seem, has a pyramidic shape. Uh, and there is an opening at the very top through which someone can enter. Much as the Great Pyramid in Giza has no capstone on the top of it. That's another study in itself. When Christ's flesh was torn, John chapter 19, with a Roman spear, the veil in that temple was also rent. Go back, if you will, to John chapter 19. John 19, and notice one verse there, verse 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came throughout blood and water. And also Matthew 25, Matthew 25, verses 50 and 51. Wait, no, there is no. I'm in the wrong chapter. It might be my fault. Bob Jones Sr. used to tell people, undoubtedly the trouble is with you. And uh, that's probably the case here. Where's that? Suddenly, it's probably right in front of me, and I'm, I'm missing it. Matthew 27. Yeah, Matthew 27, verses 50 and 51. I'm glad I have a daughter in the audience here that's also a Bible student. You want to come up here and finish for me? Because I, <laughs> That's okay. Matthew 27. Verses 50 and 51, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Thank you, Elizabeth. <clears throat> the typology is inescapable. Uh, there's a hole in the north end of the universe through which a man can pass through. Think about that. Therefore, the Lord Jesus said, uh, I am the door, by me if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out, and shall find pasture. John chapter 10, verse 9. Verse 21, And having a high priest over the house of God, as in the sense of the household, the entire family, not a physical building. That's the mistake so many people make. They think the house of God is limited to a physical building we erect or we, we build somewhere at a brick and mortar. Not so. Notice we compare Scripture with Scripture. Look forward at Hebrews 11 and verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. That meant his household, his entire family of eight people. Also go back, if you will, to the book of Acts chapter 16. Acts 16, 
And those are verses 30 and 31. In the Philippian jailer, says, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. As if they believe, they'll be saved too. He meant the household, all the family, immediate family of that jailer. Then go forward also again to 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy and chapter 3. 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the ground of the truth, excuse me, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. It has nothing to do with the building of brick and mortar or stone masonry or concrete wall or anything of that at all. It has to do with people, a collective body of believers. And then back to our text in Hebrews 10, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our heart sprinkled from, the evil, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. In the middle of verse 22, it reads, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Look back at chapter 9 and verse 9. Chapter 9, verse 9, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. And also chapter um, 9, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And if the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament could have wrought eternal salvation for the one who brought one, then look at the question in chapter 10, verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But they kept doing it day after day because they were unable to grant eternal forgiveness and permanent cleansing once and for all to the guilty parties. So the reference in our text is to someone who has trusted the completed work of Christ, and we you recall the verses back in chapter 10, verses about 10 through 14, as Christ offered himself once for all, and then sat down on the right hand of God. Uh, we talked about that at great length, I think, last time, how that, that is rejected by Roman Catholicism and um, partially rejected by Lutheranism and the Episcopalian Church, or Anglicans, uh, and others. Catholics believe that the elements of bread and wine are completely changed into the human flesh and blood of Jesus by the miracles of the priest, the authority of the priest, before it ever goes into the sinner's mouth. It's just conveniently tastes like some sort of bread and wine. Uh, Episcopalians have the idea that it's, it's, uh, it turns into Christ's flesh and blood after it goes into the mouth. So there's no chance of it spilling on the ground, and well, that's Jesus' body nine. But it turns into his body and blood after it goes in. And Lutherans have this belief that it's both his body, blood, and physical bread and wine somehow at the same time. We believe it's bread and, and grape juice, and that's all it is. <laughs> it's simply a symbol of Christ's body and blood. It's not really his body and blood. It's actually become his body and blood. It's not his flesh and, and a piece of bread at the same time. There's a church over in near my job, and they use that Hawaiian bread, those Hawaiian rolls for their communion. I guess they're, they never learn anything about the significance of leaven and the, the symbolism of leaven representing uh, sin that's been added into uh, pure life. They, so they have no, I, no concept of trying to be somewhat scriptural in their Lord's Supper. I don't know what they believe about it, but they certainly don't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for the saving of the soul. <clears throat> but, uh, let me get back to my notes here. 
But the next phrase in verse 22, and our bodies washed with pure water. And since the word sprinkle is found in the text, it gives the Anglicans and the Lutherans and the Catholics and some Methodists all the justification they need to sprinkle in, in their form of baptism or sprinkle babies. And look at chapter 9, also in verse 19, the language of verse 19, for good measure. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. So wherever they find the word sprinkling, they want to connect it with the ordinance of water baptism and say that this now, uh, water baptism replaces circumcision in the life of someone who believes in God, whereas circumcision was a, a seal to confirm someone was a true uh, Jew and a follower of the law. They believe that water baptism effectively does the same thing now in, for the, in the name of Jesus Christ. Having cast off the old customs of Judaism, now they believe Christianity supplants it, takes over, and has fully replaced uh, the belief of the Jew. If the Jew was intended to disappear and dwindle, then there, there would be no Jews today. No one would even be claiming to be a Jew. Their identity would have disappeared 1900 years ago with the dispersing of all the Jews in 70 AD. But it continued for a long time. Now we have to admit that supposedly no Jews today know exactly which tribe their family has descended from. But I am fully confident that God knows who's who. Some things you have to leave in the hands of God. If you, know, if you don't have all the answers for it, you have some inkling that it's true, you have to leave it up to God. But um, when the Jews said to Pilate, his blood be upon us and our children, that's certainly something God the Father listened to and heard. He couldn't take that lightly. And uh, Jewish people wonder why the world hates them. Why do, we, why do we get blamed for all the world's evils? And they don't want to consider the possibility that the sins of their fathers have been visited upon the children of third and fourth generations and beyond because their ancestors rejected the Messiah when he came. And by and large, the whole nation rejected him. A few received Christ as their Savior and their Messiah. <clears throat> but God dispersed them. God offered the gospel to whosoever will because as a nation, they collectively rejected it. And the rejection of Israel was seen at least three specific times in the book of Acts. And then God opens the door to whoever will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, Jew or Gentile, is going to be forgiven and granted the likeness of Jesus Christ one day, whether they were circumcised as babies, whether they observed a kosher diet prior to that time, or anything else. Those things are now irrelevant when it comes to the saving of a soul and the forgiveness of the sins of a sinner. But um, uh, so for groups like uh, that want to replace, want water, what baptism of someone replace circumcision as a seal of their salvation, and they get that language. Let me turn, read it to you. It's over in Romans chapter, Romans 4. Romans 4, verse 11. And he received the sign of excuse me, of Abraham, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And I'm glad that Paul clarified that because I'm certainly included uh, as someone who is not Jewish. But um, uh, this leads to what's called covenant theology, that somehow, because of your, some action your parents rendered in having you baptized or sprinkled by a priest or a minister or a minstrel, 
and a lot of women ministers out there, um, that somehow you have entered into the identity of being a Christian. Whether you live like one or you know anything about the Lord Jesus, whether you've ever trusted him to be your Savior is irrelevant because your parents had you sprinkled by some minister or some priest when you were a baby. That's all that's necessary. Now you've entered into the life of being a Christian. And that effectively was the new birth for you. And yet, uh, you know, churches like that, they have all these different steps, and they're always applying this step, saying this step affects salvation. This step it brings you into the church. This step brings you into the family of God. This step brings you... And they can never quite tell you for sure, if they died right now, whether they'd wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ. I have a, an a, a acquaintance that I see through my job, a Roman Catholic priest, the other day, I was at his church, and he was going through his sermon of sorts, and he stumbles around trying to explain how that salvation comes because someone was a member of Christ's church, and they took the sacraments, and they had a holy, in, a eternal life granted them every time they partook of the Lord's table, you know, the bread and the wine, and, um, and then when he comes to offering communion, uh, only those who are Catholics are entitled to have it, and then only Catholics who are prepared to receive it are allowed to come. Um, in order to be prepared to receive communion, you have to first confess your sins, make a confession to a priest, and have that taken care of. Once you do that, then you're now qualified to partake of the Mass, the bread and, and the wine. Uh, if you're lucky enough, you get the wine, but usually you just get the bread. Uh, and that's limited only to people who are members of the Roman Catholic religion. So everybody else is out of luck. In the Council of Trent in the 1540s, they said if anyone denies that contained in the Eucharist is the entire body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, the entire Christ, uh, let him be anathema, accursed. So all the power to save a soul, all the power to forgive sins is contained in that bread and in that cup. But it's only reserved for those who become members of our church first. You become a member, you enter into the life of Christianity. Well then, what, do I have to, well, what else do I have to do? Well then, you get baptized. You enter into the life of Christ. And then you make a confession. You enter into the life of Christ. Then you take communion as often as you can. You enter into the life. All these things are supposedly entering you into the life of Christ. And they can never quite say, it's okay, it's all finished, all said and done now. Nothing needs, more needs to be done. And he stumbled around so feebly trying to explain what salvation was because, and this is kind of funny, he rode with me a couple years ago in the funeral car as I was, we were heading on the way to a cemetery after another funeral. And we got to talking about each, with each other and I told him I was a pastor and a Baptist preacher. And uh, suddenly he knew he better watch out because generally speaking, Baptists read their Bibles more than other people do, certainly more, much more than the Catholic does. And we got to talking about a number of spiritual things he knew he, would, he, he wouldn't dare debate a real Bible-believing Christian. And we pulled up in front of his church. I was going to give him a ride back home. And across the street from his church, there's a nursing home uh, by a Christian group. And they have a big sign of, of Scripture out in front of their entrance. And so that group across the street there, they, uh, they think that we're not saved. Yeah, I, had to bite my, I had to bite my tongue. I only had to bite my tongue because, you know, you deal with these people regularly through work. And you don't want to offend somebody or get them mad at you, have them call your boss and complain, you know, that your guy's coming on too strong, he's a little pushy. And what I really wanted to say was, you know, I've read your books on apologetics. I've read all of your answers, and you don't know whether you're saved or not. That's the standard answer a Catholic is taught to give. Nobody can know for sure. That's called the sin of presumption. We trust that we're doing everything God has commanded us to do, and he'll reward us accordingly. And a guy asked if I wanted to join his lodge one time. And he said, uh, now when they ask you some questions, if they ask, do you believe in God, make sure you say, yes, I believe in God. Otherwise, you know, you'll disqualify yourself right away. And I told him, you know, I'm not going to join. I, I'm too busy, and I don't think it's quite interests interest me enough. 
but I want to know more about that. I want to know, does he have a name? How can he be contacted, right? Was he, has he revealed himself? Well, I want to know more about God than whether or not he exists. You'd have to be a moron to not realize God exists. There are a lot of morons out there. The fool had said in his heart, there is no God. Psalm 14, verse 1. So April 1st is National Atheist Day in the United States, right? <laughs> April Fool's Day. But anyway, I wanted to tell this priest, and, and then, so he was stumbling around trying to explain the gospel because I was sitting in the back pew of his church uh, listening to everything he said, and he knew that I knew the Bible much better than he did, and he's feebly trying to explain what the gospel is or how you get saved or how this person had received Christ or how this person was often fed at the table of the Lord and so forth and had the life of Christ repeatedly because she went to Mass every week and all of these things. And if you were to press someone in that church, if you died right now, would you know that you'd wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ? The standard answer Catholics are taught to give is no, nobody knows. That's the sin of presumption. We believe we're doing everything we're supposed to do, and ultimately it's up to God. Well, I want more than an insurance policy. I want assurance that if I have an accident, it's going to pay, it's going to take care of the expenses. Don't just promise it will, and a handshake and the good word of the salesman that, that sold us the policy. We want something in writing. That's why the Bible is so important to us. And it uh, means so little to everybody else. But let me move on here. Uh, so groups like that that believe in what we call covenant theology, they, they tend to believe that when you get baptized in water or sprinkled, somehow you, your old nature, or your old reputation has then been, been done away with and has been crucified by that act, by that action, that formula, that ordinance, or that sacrament, whatever term they use, somehow your old nature has been crucified, and now you're a new Christian because you were baptized. But water baptism is not just a picture of Christ's death. It's a picture of his death, burial, and resurrection. And this is what we depict when we are baptized. When we get baptized in water, by, by the way, if someone dies, you don't take that man and lean him up against a wall or up against a tree and throw dirt at him. You bury him. So a, a, a biblical baptism in the New Testament would be complete immersion. Wouldn't simply be sprinkling on the forehead with a seashell or a, a curved leaf or whatever they want to use this week. And you've all heard of them doing that. Or the dirty hands of whoever's putting his put the water on the baby's head. The baby doesn't know anything, so it affects nothing. But you bury them. So scriptural baptism would be a burial, a type of burial, like full immersion. And that's why we, we also believe in immersion. But um, somehow the fallen nature is crucified automatically when you get sprinkled by the priest or the, or the minister. However, water baptism is... Um, is a picture of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Run back quickly, and I've meandered here from point to point. Go back to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. And let's read, I think, the first four or five verses there. <clears throat> what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That is, shall I keep sinning to prove that God will save me by his grace? Just to prove a point? Paul said, God forbid, don't do that. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Water baptism is a picture of your salvation. My old nature is dead, just as Christ was dead. It's been put under the water just as he was buried in a tomb. And I come out identifying myself with him uh, to walk in newness of life. Um, you, are, you are outwardly indicating 
that an inward change is already taking place in you. And this is your way of, of illustrating it to the world by showing my old nature is dead, my new nature is alive to God. But now also, you and I are picturing our own future death. When these bodies wear out and they put you in a grave or in a mausoleum or cremate you, we're picturing that future event when these bodies die and one day Christ resurrects these bodies to give us new glorified bodies like the risen Savior, we're, we're anticipating that. That's like I mentioned in our church hour, uh, Mormons take that little word for, baptized for the dead, and they apply it to people in the past when it should be applied in the future, in anticipation of a future resurrection. That's what you're picturing when you're baptized in water. Water baptism doesn't save anyone. It doesn't do anything. It's not the means of your salvation. It's simply a picture of your salvation. But um, run, run back, if you will, to Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. It's in the Old Testament, right after the book of Ezekiel, chapter 35. Ezekiel 36. And verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Notice what happens, verse 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Well, is that literally going to happen? No. It's figurative. The uh, people already had fleshy hearts when Ezekiel was writing to them. So it's, it's figurative of their, their heart, their desire to rebel and sin against God being changed to a desire now to obey God and live right by the commandments of God. It's figurative. And uh, the Bible uses a lot of language figuratively. And if you press it absolutely literally, then you see it falls apart because they already had hearts of flesh when they received that prophecy. So it has to be taken figuratively rather than a heart of rebellion, a heart of obedience. The Bible talks about the un an uncircumcised or circumcised ear. That means an ear ready to hear what God wants to say or a circumcised heart. That means a heart that's willing to receive what God wants to give it. So you have to discern the language when you're reading through the Bible. And it shouldn't be that difficult. But the word, since he used the word sprinkle there in verse 25, that's another text people will say, well see, baptism is to be done by sprinkling. And they'll ignore the larger context that this is God speaking figuratively about the, the heart changing towards him. Look also forward at 1 Peter 3. This is a great one. They all know, they all I use. 1 Peter 3. You've already looked at more scripture on the subject of baptism and sprinkling than most of the other churches will ever look at. So congratulations to you. 1 Peter 3, verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, parentheses, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So water baptism is a picture of your salvation, not the means of it. It doesn't cleanse you from any sin uh, by getting wet or getting baptized in any way. The words, uh, let us are found three times in this section, in our chapter. Let us draw near, he says in verse 22. Let us hold fast, verse 23. And then let us consider, later in verse 24. Jump ahead for a moment to verse 24, Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. That certainly matches Paul's epistles elsewhere. Uh, go back, if you will, to the book of Titus. The little book of Titus. And I think it's Titus chapter 2. Titus 
Titus 2 and <clears throat> verse 12, or verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Another case where you, simple discerning of the English language is helpful. It didn't appear to each in, in, individual man one at a time, but hath, hath appeared on the benefit, for the on the sake, on the behalf, or for the benefit of all men. So we'll turn to it. Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. So I'm going to stop right there. We're going to come back to verse 23 next week, God willing, and move forward because the book of Hebrews deals with um, blessings to the Christian today and also instructions to someone left behind after the rapture takes place who finds himself in the tribulation. And this is why the book of Hebrews through Revelation are what we call general epistles. They are intended for someone left behind after the rapture takes place and they're to maintain their life with God by faith in Jesus Christ and living a life of good works. The Jew will have Jewish commandments to obey. The Gentile will have commandments to help the Jew in his time of persecution and so forth. We'll look into that a little more deeply, God willing, next week.